excited to have you guys here with us tonight. This is the 2011 Whitney Awards Gala, so if you're in the wrong room, this is your turn to go see if there's another event here. But if you're in the right place, we are so excited to have you. It is so fun to look at over the whole room. This gala is the pinnacle of our year. Many of us on the Whitney Awards Committee have been working very hard. The authors that we honor tonight have been working even harder. And it's very exciting for us to be here and to present the Whitney Awards for 2011. There's a lot of people that worked especially hard to make this night work. We would like to thank Gary Brown, who designed our program again this year. did an excellent job. And also a big thanks to the advertisers who put ads in this year's program. It was very, very generous. And as a nonprofit that survives because of donations, we thank you very much for your support. Erin Summerill is our photographer. Erin, if you'll just stand up and wave. <laughs> so she's pointing her camera at you. She's not being creepy. <laughs> and try and smile and look cute because you're gonna your pictures will be online in a couple of weeks. So we really appreciate her being here. This is the second year that she's done this for us, and we're very lucky to have a professional photographer taking taking the photographic history of this event. And also, Jackie Fowers is over here, and she is videotaping the awards, and that will be on YouTube in a couple of weeks, and we appreciate that. And this year, we had an outstanding Whitney Awards committee. If you guys would stand as I call your name and remain standing, please. We have, and some of them might still be out in the hall, so if they can hear me, come stand in the doorway. We have Jana Parkin. There's Jana. <laughs> and Ned Lyon. Sarah Eden, unfortunately, is not feeling well and was not able to be with us tonight, but she was wonderful on our committee. Louisa Perkins. In the speculative category, 
Alloy of Law, a Mistborn novel by Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> a Night of After Darkness by Dan Wells. I Don't Want to Kill You by Dan Wells. The Lost Gate by Orson Scott Card. No Angel by Teresa Steen. And No Angel is also eligible for Best Novel by New Author. In the Youth Fiction Speculative category, my Unfair Godmother by Jeanette Rallison. <laughs> Shifting by Bethany Williams. Slayers by C.J. Hill, also known as Jeanette Rallison. Tuesdays at the Castle by Jessica Day George. Variants by Robinson Wells. In the Youth Fiction General category, Girls Don't Fly by Kristen Chandler. Violence of Ordinary by Carol Lynch Williams. Pride and Popularity by Betty James. Sean Griswold's Head by Lindsay Lovett. With a Name Like Love by Tess Cuomo. And Shifting is eligible for the best novel by the author, as is With a Name Like Love by Tess Cuomo. We are here tonight because of you guys because of the great work that you have done. And we are so honored to have the opportunity to recognize you and recognize the time and the talent and the sheer effort and blood, sweat, and tears that has gone into your contributions. Thank you for joining us and for sharing with us all that you guys possess. Deb Whitney, a former member of the Twelve Apostles, pursued and encouraged the fine arts throughout his life. <laughs> Bishop Whitney was born in 1855 in Salt Lake City, Utah. From the time he was very young, he had what was described as an artistic temperament. He loved art, music, and literature. While attending the University of Deseret, which is now the University of Utah, he formed the Wasatch Literary Association and was planning to make a career in theater in New York when he was instead called to serve a mission in the Eastern United States. Prior to this time in his life, he claimed not to be spiritually driven. He did accept the call, but did not feel that he himself was converted until he had a remarkable dream where he was a witness to Christ's atonement in the Garden of Gethsemane. By the time he returned to the Salt Lake Valley, he had not only been convert, converted himself, but through his proselytizing, he grew remarkably as a speaker and a teacher. He was offered a job with the Deseret News, and was called as bishop at the age of 22 and as of yet unmarried. He quickly remedied this and married Zina Smoot a year after he was called as bishop, and they had their first child a year after that. In the years that followed, he served a mission to Europe, continued to work at the Desert News, and served in local politics. Amid it all, however, he found time to pursue his passions in writing. His first book, The Life of Heber C. Kimball, was published in 1888, and soon followed by his first book of poetry, which was a love of his that he had pursued throughout his life. Politically, he advocated women's suffrage, protection against persecuted polygamists, say that 10 times, <laughs> and also fought against compulsory vaccination, which I found interesting because we're still kind of in those same things. Uh, he was hired to teach philosophy at Brigham Young College in Logan, but when no one signed up for his classes, he ended up teaching theology and English instead, and from that point forward began lecturing on a regular basis. It's been said that in literary work, discourses, lectures, orations, funeral sermons, and miscellaneous addresses, along with his ecclesiastical labors, his mind and tongue and pen were kept constantly busy. After 28 years as a bishop, seven of which were also spent working in the church historical department. Orson F. Whitney was called as a member of the Twelve in 1906, but asked friends and acquaintances to continue calling him Bishop Whitney, in part because he had created most of his literary works as a bishop and preferred that identification. Time and again, the message of his talks and presentations were to encourage people to use the gifts given to them and see within those gifts lasting treasures of virtue, accomplishment, and enjoyment. 
He served vigorously as a member of the Twelve Apostles for 25 years until his death in 1931. The excerpt that we chose as, or that was chosen as the foundation for the Whitney Awards is from an address delivered at a Sunday evening session of, a, of the MIA Jubilee Conference held on June 7, 1925. He said, We will yet have Milton's and Shakespeare's of our own. God's ammunition is not exhausted. In God's name and by his help, we will build up a literature whose tops will touch the heavens. In 1976, Elder Boyd K. Packer repeated those words and added, since that statement was made in 1888, those foundations have been raised up very slowly. The greatest poems are not yet written, nor the paintings finished. The greatest hymns and anthems of the Restoration are yet to be composed. The sublimest renditions of them are yet to be conducted. Tonight, we gather as part of our attempt to one day fulfill these prophecies. Words are a powerful force. Words build and destroy nations. They build and destroy ideas. They build and destroy people. It is through the gift of literature that we have our understanding of the creation, of Christ's ministry, of Nephi's journey to the promised land. It is through words that we've learned of science, governments, the universe, and the intricate detail of human nature. In 1988, exactly 100 years after Orson F. Whitney shared his thoughts about literature reaching toward the heavens, Thomas S. Monson said, God left the world unfinished for man to work his skill upon. He left the electricity in the cloud, the oil in the earth. He left the rivers unbridged and the forests unfelled and the cities unbuilt. God gives to man the challenge of raw materials, not the ease of finished things. He leaves the pictures unpainted and the music unsung and the problems unsolved that man might know the joys and glories of creation. Writers know the joys and glories and pain and agony of creation. The experience of that process is priceless on a personal level, and as Bishop Whitney's life reflects, none of us knows the journey our lives may take. Our lives unfold one day, one word, one experience at a time, and it is left to us to hone our craft and enjoy the ride we find ourselves upon. With such reverence of the gifts and talents overflowing in this room, it is therefore an honor for us to honor the time and dedication that has gone into the creations of these 35 finalists, as well as lifetime creations by our achievement winners this year, Douglas Thayer and Jack Wayland. We are so honored and privileged to have you in attendance and to continue with this awards program. Um, for those of you that are presenting, if you will consult the program, which is on the back of your program, um, I sent out emails and I very nicely myself gave you the wrong order. So forget you ever got an email from me and just look at the back program and if you would follow that accordingly, we will move on to the award program. We will start with the award for best general fiction presented by Shanda Cottom, Mindy Holt, and Sheila Staley who run the LDS Women's Book Review. The word general is defined as applicable to or affecting the whole, being usually the case or applicable in most cases. The books, found, the books found in this category may be identified as general, but they are all very unique. The words memorable and inspiring are definitely applicable to this year's general category as a whole. Each of these books will make you wonder, think, smile, and maybe even cry in the end. The hearts of their readers can't help but be touched by these stories of people who, like them, are struggling through hardships as they overcome their trials. We are honored to present the finalists in the 2011 Whitney Award General Category. Before I Say Goodbye by Rachel Ann Noonish is the powerful story of a single mom who comes full circle in her life and returns home to find a family to care for her children. The theme of love and forgiveness is infused in this story. Gifted by Carrie White, 
tells the story of a long-awaited child born with unique spiritual gifts. These gifts help, help others and change the life of this family. It has a strong message about family and having hope for the future. The Evolution of Thomas Hall by King Mel is the tale of an egocentric agnostic who is also a very talented artist. We follow his journey of trial and error as he finally comes to know Christ. The Walk, Miles to Go by Richard Paulins, conveys the life of a man who goes from riches to rags. Alan loses everything in his life, his home, business, and the love of his life. As he walks away from his old life, he goes on a cross-country journey of self-discovery. The Wedding Letters by Jason Everett. This book begins several years after the Wednesday Letters ends. It tells the story of new love, hidden secrets, and family coming together, both, again, both in crisis and in celebration. Generally speaking, all of these books are well-deserving of the movie uh, of winning this year's general category Whitney Award. And the winner is. Before I say goodbye by Rachel Ann Newton.
that's in none of our hearts. So my heart is very full tonight, just of gratitude. So much gratitude for this blessing of what we do. Thank you very much. It says Sarah Eden in your programs, but she had to go home sick, and this was the best I could do last minute. <laughs>
After that, he received a doctorate in physics from BYU. He and his wife, Cheryl, are the parents of five children. They live in Rexburg, Idaho, where Jack recently retired as a professor of physics at BYU, Idaho. Next week, they enter the MTC before uh, embarking on their second mission, this time to Philadelphia. From Jack's website, quote, what is the probability that someone with a PhD in physics, someone who dropped out of one course of creative writing because of poor work, and who later signed up for a correspondence course in writing, but never finished it, will someday write a first novel, which will become a regional bestseller? The probability is not zero, because it happened to me, end quote. Since the phenomenal success of Charlie, Jack has gone on to write more than 25 best-selling books, practically inventing the genre of LDS fiction along the way. I think every writer in the room will identify with the following quote from Jack. Quote, it's good for me to write short stories because then I can become acquainted with characters that I'm interested in. This may sound crazy, but I was once in a Sunday school class where I raised my hand and said, I knew this guy once, and then I stopped and said, never mind. <laughs>
and is arguably the longest sustained crime series by a living writer. None of her books has ever been out of print, and over 26 million books are in print worldwide. In 1990, Anne started a second series of detective novels featuring the private detective, William Monk, and volatile nurse, Hester Latterly. The most recent of these, which is the 17th in the series, is Acceptable Loss, which appeared in the New York Times bestsellers list at number 22 and is nominated tonight for a 2011 Whitney Award. Jenny Hansen was born in Idaho Falls and lived in many farming and ranching communities in Idaho and Montana. She graduated from Ricks College and then when her oldest child was married and her youngest was in high school, she continued her education at Westminster College in Utah. She has been a freelance magazine writer, editor, newspaper reporter, and writer with 23 published novels to her credit. Five years ago, the Whitney Committee honored her with the 2007 Lifetime Achievement Award. She is certainly well known in the LDS writing community as every author hopes to have his or her latest book reviewed by Jenny Henson of Review Magazine. Her latest book, If I Should Die, is a Whitney finalist this year. Tracy Hunter Abramson is originally from Arizona. After graduating from Brigham Young University with a degree in business, she moved to Northern Virginia where she worked for the CIA for six years. She is now a full-time mom and coaches the North Stafford High School swim team. She started writing over 10 years ago after resigning from the CIA, and it took her more than seven years to finally create a manuscript that was worth publishing. A frequent Whitney Award nominee who publishes two books a year, she's more than made up for that seven years. Her long list of publications includes this year's Whitney Award nominee, Smokescreen. Stephanie Black was born in Utah and has lived in various places, including Arizona, Massachusetts, New York, and Limerick Island. She has enjoyed making up stories since she was a child and even took a creative writing class in high school. She says her adolescent writing stunk, <laughs> though, <clears throat> since she hadn't yet figured out what, excuse me, that she hadn't yet figured out that a story needs a plot. <laughs> I think she must have figured it out in the intervening years because her books won the Whitney Award for Mystery Suspense in 2008, 2009, and 2010. Her most recent book, Rearview Mirror, is a Whitney finalist this year. Greg Luke was raised in Santa Barbara, California, and my claim to fame is that we grew up in the same ward. Um, and I remember him as a super cool priest. <laughs> <laughs> After serving a mission in Wisconsin, he attended the University of Utah College of Pharmacy and is currently the Director of Pharmacy for the Cache Valley Community Health Center in Logan. He began his literary career writing and illustrating short stories, none of which were ever published. It took nearly 10 years before he had any success getting published, but he's enjoyed great success since then. Each of his novels has been nominated for a Whitney Award, including tonight's nominee, Bloodborne. And the winner is... Ah, rear view mirror by Stephanie <laughs> Black. I don't know how people found calm up here. 
but I have no idea what to say. This is just such a tremendous honor. I just am overwhelmed. Just thank you so much. Um, I'm, and to stand up here right after Jack Whalen is amazing. I, like Louisa, remember reading Charlie and Sam and, and loving those books, and, and what an honor to, to be at the same podium that, that Jack was at just a moment before. And I'm just so grateful for everyone who has been such a, a great influence on me and, and been such a support uh, in my writing. I'm grateful for uh, uh, Kirk Shaw, my editor of Covenant, who's just marvelous to work with, and Angela Eschler, who was my first editor, and all the wonderful people at, at Covenant. Um, Storymakers is uh, such a wonderful organization. This conference is the highlight of my year. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, with this particular book, I'm grateful to uh, Professor Sam Mayo, who was an English professor that I sent questions to to find out about the life of an English professor, which I found it is much more difficult than I had realized, although usually you're not someone's not trying to kill you, but it didn't sound a whole lot easier than that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just overwhelmed. Thank you. This year's finalists for Best General Youth Fiction span a range of subject and matter, subject matter and tone. There's a story about a teenage girl whose life turns upside down, and, she learned, and as she learns about birds, she discovers what it means for her to fly. We follow the struggles of a young girl battling her mother's demons and her father's ghost, grandfather's ghost. There's a lighthearted take of a Jane Austen favorite set in one modern day high school. There's a young woman who embarks on a journey of therapeutic, a therapeutic way in analyzing a boy's head sitting in school in front of her as he does with her father's illness. And finally, a traveling minister's family who lands in the middle of a murder mystery in the South, complete with forgiveness, hope, and frogs. <laughs> the youth fiction general finalists are Girls Don't Fly by Kristen Chandler, Miles from Ordinary by Carol Lynch Williams, Pride and Popularity by Jenny James, Sean Griswold's Head by Lindsay Levitt, and With a Name Like Love by Tess Helmo. And the Whitney Award goes to With a Name Like Love. <laughs>
more than double the next highest category, so highly competitive. The finalists in the speculative fiction category are My Unfair Godmother by Jeanette Rollison, Shifting by Bethany Wiggins, Slayers by C.J. Hill, Tuesdays at the Castle by Jessica Day George, and Variant by Robison Wells. The winner, the Whitney goes to, for Best Speculative Youth Fiction Novel 2011, Barry <laughs> Really, really good. It's just so much fun. Thank you. 
Um, so tonight we decided we would turn the tables a little bit um, on online book reviewers because we all know that no author's success is complete without that pivotal role of the online book reviewer. Am I right? Yes. yes. So we decided to twist a little bit and take their words out of context because heaven knows they take your words out of context. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and sometimes online reviewers need good edits. That's why. They are terrible. They're marking up all day. All day. They're making fortune. <laughs> I'm sensing a sub, a, a extra, niche. a niche market, maybe some freelance work. 50-50? Mm -hmm. I'll take six. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we found a couple reviews that were just spot on, and then we tweaked them. Okay, so here's uh, Dan Wallace's finale to his Serial Killer series. Uh, Tor.com, of all places, we found this great one. Wells has an excellent grasp. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can attest to this. If you shake that man's hand, you're going to your knees. <laughs> and in Hasselhoff, watch out, because they are coming to Germany. And, yeah, you're done. You're done. Okay. Next one, uh, Brandon Sanderson's spin-off on the wonderful Miss Porn series. Brandon Sanderson is secretly keeping a team of authors hostage in his basement. <laughs> <laughs> to date, I think Dan Wells is the only escapee. <laughs> Didn't you read about it in book two? <laughs> <laughs> got, got right out of there. True story. That, that was actually got there. <laughs> the last date. The Lost Gate by Orson Scott Card. This was AV Club, okay? Notice how nobody ever writes a series about a young boy with an amazing knack for toilet cleaning and tax reform. <laughs> or maybe he did, and there's just added meaning to Ender's Game. <laughs> okay, Teresa Sneed's novel. Her debut. Amazon, of all places, right? Oh, by the way, we skipped Goodreads because it's like shooting fish in a barrel. Okay. <laughs> so Amazon. This is my favorite. <laughs> I have never read a book. <laughs> I think it was Amazon, right? Okay. okay, Dan Wells' second book, because it wasn't just good enough to have one. We had to have two, okay? The second book came from a book reviewer who shall remain anonymous because I don't want to embarrass her. She might be in the room. I don't want to get accosted on the way to the parking lot, okay? That's a digression on top of a digression. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the definition of an online book reviewer. <laughs> Thank you all. Any day I can be 
complete a Wells brother twice in one category is great. <laughs> No, I, um, I appreciate everyone who helped me out in this book. Dan was one of them in my writing group. Um, and, you know, I appreciate all of you. And science fiction and fantasy, um, we really like to explore people's dreams, the possibilities that could be, the nightmares that could be, and the, the dreams of, you know, what might have been, um, as we kind of just really try to express the things that couldn't exist that we wish could. And in a lot of ways, giving me awards like this is supporting my dreams. So thank you very much. When I officially met Douglas Thayer tonight, I told him that my dad was a BYU professor too. And he said, well, who's your dad? And I told him who it was. And he said, he was my student. <laughs> my dad retired about six years ago, and Brother Thayer retired last year. <laughs> Douglas H. Thayer is considered one of the foremost fiction writers exploring contemporary Mormon life and has been called the morning Mormon Hemingway for his straightforward style and powerful prose. Orson Scott Card has said, Thayer is one of the most truthful writers I know. Add, that, add to that the clarity and beauty of his writing, and his fiction is always illuminating in every sense. Thayer, Thayer was born in Salt Lake, but he grew up in Provo, right here where he enjoyed fishing, hunting, hiking, and learning to work hard. In fact, he had quite a few varied jobs which helped him create his fiction later on in life. He worked as a uranium drill rig worker, a construction laborer. He worked on the railroad, a janitor, restaurant dishwasher, insurance salesman, and a seasonal ranger in Yellowstone. In 1946, he dropped out of high school at the age of 17 to serve in the war. He went to the war ravaged Germany, and when he returned from the war, he went back to Germany and served a 30-month mission for the LDS Church. When he came home from his mission, he got his degree at BYU, and then he went on to earn an MA from Stanford. He decided that he wanted to get a doctorate, so he started working on that at Stanford, but then he dropped out. He decided, well, I'll get a doctorate from the University of Maryland. He dropped out. Finally, he decided he really wanted an MFA in creative writing, and he got that at the University of Iowa. In 1974, he married Donlu DeWitt, and she has her own long list of credentials. She holds a bachelor's, master's, and law degree from Brigham Young University and she has taught writing at the BYU English Department and Honors Program. And she was saying, all I really wanted to do was write, but she always just ended up editing everybody else. He told her it's not too late. Thayer is perhaps best known for his coming of age stories. He's been called the first, the finest chronicler of the Mormon youth in culture. In total, he has published three novels, dozens of short stories, several essays, and memoir, and is a recipient of many literature awards, including several dialogue prizes for the short story and essay, the P.A. Christensen Award, the Association for Mormon Letters Prize in the Novel, the Carl G. Mazur Creative Arts Award, and the Utah Institute of Fine Arts Award in the short story. As a member of the Whitney Committee, I am more than pleased to present the Lifetime Achievement Whitney Award to Brother Thayer. Stanford 
I was 27 years old, he wrote back and said, unless you learn to write the English language, you will not get your degree. <laughs> that was encouraging. <laughs> I rewrote the thesis five times and submitted it. Uh, and then when I published my first short story, uh, a colleague, I shared an office with him at the time, said, I'm surprised you never published anything after reading your early stuff. And uh, Frank is back there in the corner. He didn't mention when he was up here that he's a student of mine, uh, or was at one time. And he used to work out here at the, as I recall, at the, um, the desk down here. That's where he did the, the night clerk. He also has a fascination with fish. And he had an aquarium full of fish. And he was very poor at the time when I accused him of frying his goldfish for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> he said he never did. Anyway, thank you very much. I deeply appreciate this. I'm pleased my wife is here. She's supported me through all this. Thank you very much. Over the last few years, we've gone through all the stages of the writer's journey about 200 times. As we join our writing friends every step of the way, we've written, revised, edited, critiqued, polished, queried, and submitted together. We've encouraged one another after rejections, and we've, and we've celebrated requests. <coughs> Sorry. And we've celebrated requests together. Some of the greatest moments have come as we reveled in the excitement along with so many of these friends when they finally, when finally a publisher says yes, and then there's lots of happy answers. <laughs> <laughs> we really do that. <laughs> we actually really do. <laughs> we know the hard work of publication because we have been there and we have watched and helped so many of our friends along the way. Um, we are so honored to be presenting the award, the award that celebrates that, that first moment of crowning glory when you get to hold your very first published book in your hand and feel the joy and validation that come between those covers. Um, we salute all of the unpublished authors in the room, in the room who are continue, continue to fight a good fight, um, and we congratulate all the published authors and all of the Whitney finalists here. But after witnessing and walking the writer's road so many times, we, um, we authors in Cognito hold a special place in our hearts for the Best Novel by a New Author Award. And um, we just want to say, you got, all of the nominees are so awesome. And those nominees are Gifted by Carrie White, Daughter of Helaman by Misty Munker, The List by Melly, Melanie Jacobson, No Angel by Teresa Sneed, Shifting by Bethany Wiggins, and With a Name Like Love by Tess Elmo. And the 2011 Whitney Award for Best Novel by New Author goes to With a Name Like Love by Tess Elmo. Get published, so 
It's really been a long and wonderful journey. It was nine years this novel was for me um, to publication. So thank you very much. This is really amazing. And it's just an honor and a blessing to be here. Thank you. For the best novel of the year, every finalist has equal opportunity to get this award. We have an academy of readers who read whatever books in whatever categories they, or they read all the books in whatever categories they want to cast their votes. So you can imagine that having people read 35 books between February 3rd and April 23rd is quite a challenge. This year we had the most readers, the most voters in that category that we've ever had, which is wonderful. And again, we salute all of you who were finalists this year and appreciate all the effort that you put into your works. And this year's best novel of the year goes to I Don't Want to Kill You by Dan Black. Right round of applause for all the winners tonight. 